Hello everyone. Welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the Executive Director of the Ohio Chapter of APA and Chair of the New Urbanism Division and I am your webcast moderator. Today, Friday, July 29th, we will hear the presentation Local Foods, Planning for Prosperity in North Carolina. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box on the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number shown there in bold. And uh, for your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And uh, we will answer those at the end of the presentation during our Q&A. And please be sure to indicate uh, which one of our panelists you would like to answer the questions. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions. Thanks to all of the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today in particular, uh, our webcast is sponsored by uh, the North Carolina chapter of APA. So you can learn more about this chapter by visiting APA-NC dot org. You can learn about uh, APA's divisions by visiting planning.org slash divisions and the rest of our chapters by, by visiting planning.org slash chapters. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your My APA account. And up at the top, you can search by CM activities. Uh, and to do that, you can either type in today's event number or the title of today's webcast, both of which, again, are found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for one and a half CM credits for live viewing only. We do have recorded webcasts that are available for distance education and uh, you can check those out again at our webcast webpage ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And like us on Facebook planning webcast series to receive up-to-date information uh, on our upcoming sessions. And we are recording today's webcast um, and it uh, will be available on our YouTube channel just search Planning Webcast on YouTube, and we'll also have a PDF of the presentation available after the end of our session, again, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Okay, so I'd now like to introduce our two speakers for today and get us started. Uh, up first is Emily Edmonds. She currently serves as the Extension and Outreach Program Manager for the NC Growing Together Project at North Carolina State University Center for Environmental Farming Systems. A former small business owner and Western North Carolina native, she holds an MPA from UNC Chapel Hill and has worked in local and regional food systems land conservation, and economic development through a variety of projects across the East Coast. And she is a diehard Green Bay Packers fan and enjoys reading, gardening, hiking, and cooking. And our second speaker today is Ann Maletsky. Since 2014, Ann has served as the Executive Director of Healthy uh, Elements, a local public health nonprofit organization affiliated with the Alamance County Health Department and Alamance Regional Medical Center. Ms. Maletsky holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Averett University and a bachelor's in sociology from Longwood University. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Emily to get us started this afternoon. Emily, it's all you. All right, everyone. Everybody can see me. Yep, we can Great. see you. We can hear you. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be here today. Um, thank you, Christine, for introducing me. Um, and I'm really glad for all of you who stayed in the office on a Friday after lunch in the summer to talk about food. 
Um, we're going to cover a whole lot of really complex topics in a short amount of time today. Um, we're going to talk about local food economies and local food systems, um, learn about what's happening at the national and state levels, um, look at some of the impacts and uh, motivations across different sectors of the economy for local foods, and then kind of get into some nuts and bolts of planning strategies for um, developing local food systems and assessing local food systems. Um, this is a, a huge, huge topic, so if you have further questions, I'll be happy to answer them at the end, um, and I also am going to give you a ton of resources you can check out later. So um, I work, as, as Christine said, in North Carolina. Um, this project is a five-year USDA-funded initiative um, that looks at supply chain expansion for local and regional food systems um, across the state of North Carolina. We look at this in a number of different ways. Um, we look at farmer capacity. We work with farmers to help them get certified to sell into wholesale markets, um, work on production and processing techniques. We work with producers um, who make value-added products. And then we also partner with our wholesale and institutional buyers to sort of understand where the barriers are to putting more um, state-grown products into those markets. And the reason that I'm here today is because the fourth component of our work at MC Growing Together is to help create um, supportive business environments for small and mid-scale agriculture in, in ways that can really have a, an impact on the local food economy. And so we've been working with a lot of local governments as well as a lot of small business and entrepreneurship developers um, to sort of take the, the science of growing food and processing food and getting food to a consumer and help local governments understand the ways that they can be involved in that work. So this gives you um, an idea of how complex a local food economy is. Um, we tend to think of it as, you know, oh, the farmer grows more food and the consumer goes and buys it and eats it and everybody's happy. But there's a lot that goes into the value chain that's behind the local food economy. It starts before the farmer. Um, farming is a resource intensive business. So you need seeds, you need equipment, you need tractors. Um, you need water and sewer a lot of times, um, particularly with water resources being as constrained as they are in many parts of the country. Um, and from there, from the farmer's production level, um, products can go through a number of different channels to reach the end consumer. And this is one reason that we really focus on the resiliency of these local food economies because they do incorporate so many associated businesses with them. Um, and all of that offers really unique opportunities for planners to be involved in how and, and understanding how to encourage that work. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all of these statistics to you, but I did want to um, give you some reasons why this work is so important and the kind of impact that it can have. Um, nationally, we're seeing the same kind of growth um, that we are in North Carolina, and <clears throat> one of the um, things that I hear a lot is that, that local food is a very trendy thing to do, um, which which is true. Um, <laughs> but there's also, um, this is becoming a long-term economic trend. Um, over the last 30 years, we've seen steadily increasing demand for local foods um, across the country, really, and particularly in states that have a large uh, rural component where they're trying to hold on to their agricultural work. This is a valuable um, proposition for those communities. They want to maintain that integrity um, and they also, a lot of consumers are moving towards purchasing things that are more authentic and local foods are uh, really a, one of the best ways to capitalize on that demand for authenticity. And there's one thing I do want to point out to you here that will come up later, um, that second statistic right here. Um, <clears throat> that's what we estimate we'll need if we wanted to grow all the fruits and vegetables that this need to meet the minimum requirements per day. By 2020, we need 13 million more acres of farmland than we have right now. So we're going to talk a lot about land preservation um, and using planning tools to encourage land conservation shortly. And just this week in North Carolina, from an economic perspective um, on the impact of agriculture and agribusiness, um, typically North Carolina, we have agriculture and the military tied for the top two industries in North Carolina. Um, just this week, we learned that agriculture has moved back into the top spot with $84 billion in revenue in the past year. 
This incorporates fiber and forestry, um, which are also uh, really heavily associated with the land that's available. Um, but as you can see, the rest of that revenue is coming in large part from food manufacturing, farming and production, wholesaling and retailing. Um, so that should give you uh, an idea of why this work is so important. <coughs> So what does it have to do with planners? I get this question a lot. Um, and really, planners have so much to offer to food system development um, work and to food system advocates. Um, you have skills that a lot of these community groups and farmers and farming communities do not have, um, particularly um, data analysis, spatial analysis. Um, you also understand the political influence in the systems in which you work, um, and you have access to technologies and um, methods for making this happen that a lot of communities don't even know exist. So there are a lot of ways for you to get involved in ways that are actually really, really meaningful and will help advance this work. Um, similarly for you, um, food systems offer a number of different um, ways for you to address some systemic problems. Um, the conflict between development and land preservation being the primary one that people think of. Um, and it's also, it's a really fun field to work in right now. Um, it really helps you move from a needs-based approach to planning to an asset-based approach to planning. You get to really look at what you have and work to maintain the integrity of the region that you're in um, in a really innovative way because everyone's agricultural economy is very different. It depends on where you are. Um, so a lot of the solutions that you're seeing and a lot of the examples that I'll be citing in this presentation um, are really innovative because they're all developed um, on a sense of place. <clears throat> Um, this slide I'm going to actually spend quite a bit of time on, and I apologize that it is very text heavy. Um, local food economies are one of the most complex systems um, in the country, and they incorporate so many different elements um, of an economy, and a lot of people are coming at this from a lot of different motivations. So I want to just sort of hit the high points so that you understand the kinds of collaboration and the kinds of partners that you may want to work with um, when you begin to look at this. The, the biggest motivation um, that we see is land use and land protection, particularly for smart growth um, advocates who are looking at ways to plan for continued growth while maintaining the character of the places in which they live. Um, land protection for farming is, is one of the most important issues, I think, of the 21st century. Um, at the height of the development bubble, we were losing just over 2,000 acres a day of working farmland. Um, that rate has slowed down just a little bit, um, but the, the need to preserve working farmland um, is, is really important. And that kind of gets to the next couple of points. Um, preserving farmland also means understanding um, the aging process for farmers and their lack of succession planning a lot of times. <clears throat> family farms, particularly in North Carolina, we have a lot of family farms. Over 75% of our small farms are family owned. Um, children are not staying in their local communities. They are going to cities for educational and work opportunities and very few of them are coming back to farms. And so this land is being lost to development, um, not even from an economic perspective, but actually from um, not being able to find anyone who wants to farm that land. But what we have seen is a tremendous spike in the number of people who are interested in new and beginning farmer information, people who want that training, people who want to be farmers. So there's an immediate um, impact there for local communities that want to start trying to fill that gap by matching um, aging farmers with um, beginning farmers. And similarly, the land use discussion um, really can feed into formalizing some conversations between your rural and urban areas. Um, this is a supply and demand um, economy for local food. A lot of the markets for it are in urban areas, but all of the supply is coming from rural areas. So when you start to have these conversations between those two types of communities, um, what you're doing is not just getting at the needs of a local food economy, but you're actually starting to get people used to talking to one another from a rural perspective and an urban perspective. And that can be good across a number of different um, planning needs. Um, 
Another couple of um, important points I'd like to touch on, and you'll hear about this from Anne later, um, public health has been one of the most um, effective advocates for um, incorporating local food systems into planning work. Um, they've done a lot of work across the country. There are a lot of examples out there that I'll show you later. Um, but it, that is really coming from a food access perspective, a food security perspective. And this really allows planners who are tackling local food in their communities to understand um, the socioeconomic groups that are most in need of this work, um, as well as the physical and built environment gaps for people who need to access um, healthy foods. And it's a lot easier, you'll all know this, to put a farmer's market in a food desert than it is to recruit a big box grocery store to go into a food desert. So there are a lot of opportunities for really creative ways to make sure that the products that are being grown in your local economy are getting to the people who need them the most. And then lastly, um, I want to touch a couple of economic points. We've talked about this on a big scale um, nationally and in North Carolina. Um, but there's a lot of economic impact that can be associated with local foods. Um, until this year, we didn't actually have a way to calculate that, but now we do. Um, the USDA has um, put out a local foods economic impact toolkit. Um, this is a calculation tool that allows you to take uh, typical industry data like NAICS um, or Implan and refine it a little bit and then be able to actually calculate on a dollar for dollar basis um, how much of that investment would go back into your community if you were to take on a local food project. Um, I will point out that this requires a level we do not have um, at the moment. There are some sources for um, fine level data um, at a national level available through USDA, but it's not going to be as easy as you know pulling up your um, your state census data on something like workforce. Um, there's going to be a lot of collection and refinement involved in that, and we really encourage people to get involved with their local university systems in order to, to, to start to tackle that. Um, but in addition to you know, larger economic impact, um, it's important to remember that local food economies um, have already served um, a good purpose in revitalizing downtowns and using vacant land in downtowns, particularly in small towns for farmers markets. They are big draws for foot traffic to those areas. Um, and they also have the ability to really help you um, with your retention and expansion efforts for existing businesses. We looked at that value chain. All of those are businesses that are already in your economy. And making sure that you expand local food production and local food markets can help ensure that all of those businesses um, continue to, to grow and stay in your community. Similarly, um, one of the ways that I hear this put um, from an economic development perspective is about your mojo when you're recruiting new companies, um, and particularly companies of the 21st century who have younger workers. Um, the, the local culture is really important. Your mojo is very important, and people want to see uh, communities that they can envision themselves living in. And places with strong local food economies, um, that's a big selling point for a lot of those audiences. There are a lot of specific planning strategies that you can use um, to begin getting involved in food system development. One of the projects that we have worked on here at CEFS um, is a local government guide that specifically lays out um, planning and economic development options to support local food. We are currently in the process of revising that. Um, it was initially published in 2013, and um, we hope to have all sections finished uh, by the end of the first week of August next week. Um, but this sort of gives you um, everything from a sample of ag supportive zoning that takes into account um, setbacks and in infrastructure for farms within your zoning area to innovative ways of looking at the bona fide farm exemption which uh, we have here in North Carolina and many other states uh, have as well. Um, we also have a lot of examples where people have incorporated um, things like urban agriculture and community gardens into their UDOs um, in ways that encourage communities to implement them. Um, there are also a lot of innovative things happening with development strategies. Um, one of these is conservation development. You may have seen it called agrihoods, where uh, housing communities are built uh, not around a golf course, but actually around 
a farm and the people who live there get regular deliveries from the farm. It keeps that land uh, in protection and as working farmland and has a lot of environmental benefits um, and there are things that you can do to incentivize that. Similarly, um, there are a lot of different ways that you can and incorporate this into long range and economic planning. Um, and it does require, though, for both of those that you really remember to bring in all of those really diverse partners that we talked about earlier, um, as well as to look at the whole system's approach to um, building and expanding local food supply chains. So this is um, sort of a big picture overview of the process. It looks a lot like every other planning process that you're involved in. Um, the, the critical points that I want to make here are up top. Um, the first component of this is assessment. And what we see happening nationally with a lot of communities is that they'll get a local champion, an elected official, or somebody else who's influential, and they'll say, we got to do this, we got to get involved, we're going to build a food hub. And they'll build a food hub, and two years later, the food hub will go out of business. Um, and it's it's really, really important that before you make decisions about where to spend money in local foods, that you actually really take a deep, deep level look at your um, existing community and really understand, is my gap really a food hub, or do I just need transportation systems to get it from the farm to the aggregation center at the wholesaler's office down the road? Um, Lots of questions like that that can be answered with a good assessment process. And, and next, we're actually going to talk a little bit about how to do a community food system assessment. Um, the other really important point here um, is that we, what we have also seen across the country is that a lot of councils of government and counties and towns have incorporated agriculture and food systems into their comprehensive plans. They've got a bullet point on a piece of paper that says, yes, we want to do this, but very, very few of them are actually tying that recommendation to an actionable strategy um, with a program for evaluating whether it's working or not. And that kind of ties back to the assessment piece. It's really important to understand where you are at so that you can set some more concrete goals for where you are going forward. There are no good models out there for you to copy and paste. This is a really um, place-based approach and it requires you to really understand where you are before you can get to where you're going. Um, all those resources that I promised, um, I will make a lot of these available. Um, they'll be here in the in the presentation um, after it's recorded as well. Um, this first picture here is a sample. Um, this is for Alamance County where Anne is talking. Um, one of the projects that we took on at a statewide level that has been really, really well received already is to take the information from the United States Ag Census, which is done by USDA and your state Department of Agriculture every five years. We took 16 data points from that census and we made it easy to understand. We put pictures with it um, and arrows to show whether things are increasing or decreasing. And what this does is it takes what can be really dry information and puts it into a format in which you're going to be able to share this with local elected officials. Um, you're going to be able to really quickly provide a snapshot of what's been happening in your community. And we really also um, are pleased that we've been able to do this on a county level for all 100 counties in North Carolina, and then also to compile that at a regional level for every council of government. And the second important thing that that does is give you a way to compare the way that your agricultural economy is functioning with those around you so that you can start to identify things that you're doing very well and things that you need to work on. Um, the second picture down here is another resource that we created through this project. Um, it is a local food supply chain infrastructure map. Um, we used um, NAICS industry data purchased that, cleaned it up, and then ground truthed it with our cooperative extension services from around the state of North Carolina, um, and tried to really get a handle on everything that happens once the product leaves the farm to the time that the product reaches the consumer. And so you can see there are some of the categories that are included in this. This can be a really, really helpful way to look um, at any level, whether you're a town or a county or a council of government, and understand what pieces you do have in your county and what pieces are missing. 
Um, and I'm going to switch gears really quickly. Um, our second presenter could not be here today, and so I'm going to talk with you a little bit about community food system assessments. Um, everything here is based on the plan that uh, Wes McLeod prepared for the Cape Fear Regional Council of Governments um, in partnership with their Public Health Consortium. And you can reach him with any questions as well um, after this is over. Um, these are some of the reasons that you're going to want to look at a food system assessment. We talked about these a little bit before. Probably the two most important are that it helps establish a baseline so that you can understand the progress that you've made in the future. Um, and it gives you an inventory. And this is something that you're going to encounter um, difficulties in preparing because there's not a good centralized database that you can go to to get every farm in your state or in your county. Um, and farmers are notoriously difficult to um, register for anything. So you want to really make sure you put a lot of time into getting that inventory sorted out and then establishing some baseline data. Um, you can have any number of components of a food system assessment. Um, while a lot of what we see at a national level is that each food system assessment has a different area of em emphasis, this comes because typically you'll have um, a champion at the local level like a public health department or a food bank um, or even an agricultural economic developer who's really pushing for this. And, and so you'll see that the assessment itself takes goes into a lot of detail on those topics. Um, this is the one that was done in the southeastern part of our state, and they were public health funded for this. Um, so they looked really at how local food and food insecurity tied together and how all of that impacted public health at a larger level. Um, I do hope you like data because there's a lot of these points and you have to find the data for all of them. Um, it's really complex system and so you're looking at a lot of different things. We'll go back there one second. Um, a lot of this is going to be available data from national sources. Um, the United States Census is a good one. Um, the National Association of Food Banks has a number of these data sets and then typically your state or um, national health uh, department, the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level, and then your state Department of Health and Human Services will have a lot of this data as well. Some of it um, you'll want to work with your soil and water conservation districts or your cooperative extension services. Um, they can help you with everything from soils to what's currently being grown and where those um, products are going, which market channels they're selecting. And so just as an example, this is um, the plan that Wes provided. Um, this is how they chose to map their areas. They wanted to make sure they included the USDA food deserts. That information is available on a national level. Um, but they also included some things like community gardens and farmers markets and discount retailers as a way to start to try to get at the socioeconomic drivers um, of the local food system and where those inequalities um, were being made worse. So this is everywhere that local food moves and you want to make sure that all of these people are involved in discussing uh, barriers to accessing local food as well as um, the demand for local food. Um, what you're going to see is that even the USDA does not set a standard for local food definitions. It's different everywhere you go, depending on who you talk to. So USDA really broadly defines it as food grown within a particular um, defined area, which can be a lot of things. For our project, we work statewide, so for us, local food is everything grown in the state of North Carolina. Um, but whatever element you choose, you'll need to make sure that you tie that back to the study area that you selected um, on a geographic level. Make sure that it's workable so that you're capturing all of that information. Um, it's also important to pull out farmland preservation efforts in all of the regions that you are covering. Um, farmland preservation planning and voluntary ag districts, um, and enhanced voluntary ag districts for those of you in North Carolina, um, are some of the best places to go for our information about the food system and how it's working, um, as well as to understand who's involved in this and who needs um, 
some more assistance from you. And then the supporting infrastructure is all of those things that we talked about that make up the local food economy. So everything that supplements getting the product from a farmer to a consumer. Um, it can be things like chemical companies that do fertilizer and pesticides. It can be tractor supply companies. It can be um, people who pick it up, people who sell it, people who run a 100% cold chain um, in their distribution company and run those trucks and make sure that that is followed at a wholesale level. And then um, getting farmers involved is, is probably the most important piece of this and the hardest one to do. Um, it's really difficult to get farmers to come to meetings. They don't uh, typically become farmers because they want to go to meetings. Um, and so it really requires that you have a really strong relationship with people who are already working with farmers on a daily basis. Um, most farmers work closely with their cooperative extension office and if their extension agent says, hey, I want you to fill out this survey or I want you to go talk to this guy, they're much more likely to help you um, get to some of those issues at the very, very bottom level, um, which is for farmers. And then um, this goes back to the local food economy statistics. Um, that's where you're going to be looking at a lot of those different elements of data um, that you collected earlier, and you may also be collecting some um, original primary data as well in that process. Um, most community food assessments, assessments across the country also do have a food security component. Um, typically this is driving a lot of this work um, both for public health and for agencies that work on the front line in human services. Um, you need to identify who you're going to count as food insecure. Um, that can include SNAP recipients as well as people who don't have enough to eat but who aren't eligible for those programs. Um, similarly, we're starting to see a lot more data become available on food waste, which in this uh, image here below um, will come from your annual consumption per capita data, um, and it will show you also how much you're losing, what that gap is. Um, and then the socioeconomic status of those households in that study area are very important. Um, you want to collect it on everyone, um, all of the population in your study area because you want to be able to make those correlations. Okay, well in this neighborhood that is, you know, all making $120,000 a year or more, there are seven grocery stores. Um, that's something that you want to be able to separate out from areas that are food deserts where um, you know that the food insecure are going to be concentrated. Um, similarly, looking at the barriers to accessing healthy food, um, a lot of that can, can be uh, their access to a grocery store, their access to an outlet that offers um, full service or fresh produce, and then also people who don't have vehicles that can get them to those places, and that you're going to get from the USDA uh, food desert data. And then supporting programs, um, that's going to be everybody that you can uh, pull together from the frontline agencies that actually do this work on a daily basis, as well as your um, local health departments and your statewide health departments. Um, a lot of the assessments that we have seen come out so far at a national level do include a healthy eating and nutrition component. Um, this is because, as I said before, they have been very effective at the public health level. Um, for funding and initiating a lot of this work across the country. Um, this is some of the, the correlations that were made in the Council of Government um, in Cape Fear between where you live and what kinds of food you are able to access at the income levels at which you live. And it's really kind of eye-opening when you start to look at the food system from this entire perspective. What's really valuable about the public health component of these assessments is that it helps you understand the context of a lot of the other data that you've collected. You're not just looking at production and consumption, but you're actually looking at the nuances of what helps people get from their home or their place of work to a healthy food source and back. Um, and, and that can all be very valuable as you move forward and decide how to tackle these things and in what order to tackle them. Um, I'm going to iterate that again, making sure that when you do this work um, and you make these recommendations that you actually tie it to an actionable strategy 
um, and a way to evaluate that and make sure that it is um, being monitored and that it is actually working. Um, so for every component that you select in your food system assessment, typically you'll look at those separately and you'll identify goals for each of those components. You also will identify strategies to work towards those goals. Um, in the example of Cape Fear, they used evidence-based strategies, um, which are a public health term for um, pulling scientific evidence into the programs and policies that are set um, at the local level. You can do, choose to do that. You can choose to do it in a number of different ways. Um, some assessments will identify geographic priority areas. You can also look at this as um, priority areas that are based on socioeconomic status or that are based on specific infrastructure gaps. It really just depends on the area of emphasis that got you started on this process in the first place. Um, once you've done all of this work, though, and you've collected all of this data, you actually have this really valuable tool that does a lot of different things. Um, you're supporting um, agricultural preservation um, and giving a reason behind protecting that land from development and making sure that your development takes place in a way that really respects the character and the integrity and the economy um, of the region in which you live. Um, you're also really being very helpful for food policy councils and food advocacy groups that are trying their best to advocate for this but often don't have the tools to really look at things from this level and making sure that the goals that they're setting are really tied to what's actually happening on the ground in your region. Um, similarly, the fact that you're going to start from the beginning by working with all of these stakeholders from a lot of different places means that you have a chance to build collaborative relationships that go on a long way beyond this particular project. Um, and you're going to need them. You're going to need all of those partners, everyone from your economic development partner to your public health partner to your extension offices. All of those folks are going to continually be involved in implementing the recommendations that are going to come out of this. Um, similarly, this really helps um, establish stronger relationships between local governments and cooperative extension. This is really important, and we've seen this on a national level and in North Carolina. Um, a lot of our local government agencies and extension offices have had um, significant reductions in uh, staff and budget, and so they're all very difficult. Um, it, it's very difficult for them to communicate with one another and to really participate in strategic uh, planning around this work because they're very much focused on the day-to-day -day operations. But this process of creating a community food system assessment can be a really good way to reestablish those relationships with your extension service so that you can start to work with them and they can start to work with you um, on building small agriculture. Um, it also helps um, from a full local government perspective in sort of integrating priorities for health departments, for planning departments, for economic development departments, and this can kind of be a framework for things like budget discussions to make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, and lastly, this is something that we've put a lot of time into here at CEFs lately. Um, Reinforcing agricultural economic development goals, which is really, really important. Agricultural economic development um, refers to uh, development that is centered on agriculture in a community, typically small or mid-scale agriculture, um, but not necessarily. Sometimes it's big agriculture. Um, we only have three agricultural economic developers in North Carolina. We have one um, in Polk County, one in Orange County, and one in Henderson County. All of those people are um, in positions that were created from different reasons. One was a land use um, preservation process that wound up with citizen input asking that they create that position. Um, one was assigned to take over a research farm in that community and then um, to take over an incubator kitchen and really has since then focused on food manufacturing. Um, and then we had a third one that uh, really was put in place because of a very specific crop that was um, a huge pillar of the economy in that county that they wanted to make sure that they propped up, and that was apples in Henderson County. So you have a lot of different ways to get to agricultural economic development right now, at least in North Carolina. Most counties are just asking that their existing planning or economic development staff tackle that work. Um, but 
having this community food system assessment really gives them some, some tools that they can take uh, to decision makers to say, we need to invest in this and we need to do this in order to expand that system. So um, that is about all I have. I want to make sure that you see the website here. This is the one that is going to continue to be filled in um, over the next week, but we do have some of our resources up there for you now. Um, this is the website that will tell you about our project. There's also a lot of good tools there if you are working with specific farmers or specific industries. Um, we have everything from um, guides to GAP certification and post-harvest handling to um, studies about how uh, investing in particular equipment such as uh, processing equipment can help the businesses in your region. Um, and as I said, I'm happy to answer any questions um, either by phone or by email or at the end of this session. Um, I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here today and look forward to hearing from Anne next. Good afternoon. Can everyone see this presentation? Yes, Anne. Yep, Wonderful. looking good. I, um, very good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emily, for that fantastic overview of what's going on with food systems in North Carolina. I think it really uh, makes the point that there are a lot of resources available to our local communities, um, and tools and resources that are already of well uh, researched and developed and I've certainly taken um, advantage of them in Alamance County and hope to continue to. I will tag on to your presentation by talking a little bit about a local project we have going on and then um, speak to our collaborative model that's been our vehicle for bringing all of these different parties together and showing you, giving you a glimpse of where we are in our food assessment, which we're only about 70 to 75 percent complete on. So starting with a local story, Healthy Alamance received uh, funding to build the first permanent farmer's market in Alamance County in one of our largest food deserts. And we spent um, our planning phase talking to farmers and consumers and partners in the community to try to discover what um, barriers there might be to participation because farmers markets have historically struggled in our area. We don't have one centralized market. They have uh, cropped up throughout different municipalities based on local interest and um, more often than not they are run by volunteers and farmers who struggle to keep the farm farmers market going and lack resources for the operations of the market. So that was really valuable information and we sort of built our model off of how can we remove barriers to participation. And what really emerged for us during our first season is this opportunity to create and support infrastructure development that enhances participation not only in farmers markets but in the food system. And I would imagine that many counties in North Carolina and across the nation when they explore initiatives as part of their food systems begin to see the need to develop projects that function not only to improve access, as Emily mentioned with public health initiatives, but support that local economy. And I think that approach, um, creating a business framework as infrastructure, is the key to sustainability with these projects and allows all partners um, and all disciplines a seat at a table to um, contribute to the economic development of their community. We um, received funds from a health foundation that I'll talk about more in a minute, who's a partner of ours. Uh, and we took those funds and um, donated those as a gift to the city of Burlington to build this permanent market structure. And uh, they will build the structure in this location and it will serve the community as a farmer's market. We will lease it from them uh, during the months of operation and then hold educational and nutritional classes and ongoing opportunities for engagement at that location. You can notice the mission and vision. Those were actually developed by the community uh, and community partners together. So another 
thread that you will hear in this presentation is how to engage um, the community where you're trying to initiate interventions as a means to support uh, the sustainability of the project. I would also say about this particular project that we're really trying to move forward being able to give some sort of approximate estimate to how much money we're returning back into the local economy. Emily touched on this and it's pretty important with these projects even if they are public health initiatives that we begin to give a um, dollar amount to how this contributes to the local economy and it really helps other partners wrap their um, heads around these projects and, and what they really mean for uh, the residents of the county. So why in North Park? So I didn't include all of our maps that we have. We have had maps created that um, look at our SNAP benefits uh, with households in Alamance County and we've also taken a look at grocery stores and food deserts uh, within our county. And um, in addition to that, we have tracked some female head of household uh, in this North Park area. But I'll give you a little bit of background about Alamance County. Its uh, land area is about 428 square miles and about 70% of the county's population lives in urban areas. North Park sort of bridges in the northeast corner uh, rural and urban development. There's one school system within that that borders the community. We've done some walkability assessments and we've looked at food access in that area and it's historically had some trouble with its connectivity. It is designated a USDA food desert and uh, the one perk is that it's going to be and is on a bus route that just started this past June which is going to help improve their access to resources. The other piece I would add to this is that um, this initiative targets community members that do live near or below the poverty line. It's been identified as a very high modeled level of need by the U.S. Census. And I would add to that that this area has a high burden of lung cancer, heart disease, and stroke mortality. So just to give you some information about Healthy Alamance and Impact Alamance who co-facilitate these collaboratives I've alluded to, Healthy Alamance is a nonprofit partnership between Cone Health and the Health Department and we support the development of the community health assessment for Alamance County and we're guided by those priorities. It supports our mission to mobilize resources to develop and support a healthy nurturing community. We also are beginning to use community-based participatory research to initiate projects and try to influence policy change around built environment initiatives. I serve on the Recreation and Park Board for the county and the Planning Board for the county and that's been instrumental in uh, connecting the work of the collaboratives to the work of those departments. Impact Alamance is a health foundation that resulted from our Alamance Regional Medical Center's merger with Cone Health and they strategically invest in the community for health, hope, and prosperity. So I think it's important to tie this back to our Community Health Improvement Plan which is our answer to how we're going to address the priorities that we set in our community health assessment and that drives all of our work, not only our agency's work, but it drives these collaboratives as well. So as you can see, our 2015 priorities were access to care, education, and economic issues and we have taken a health and all policies approach to trying to set goals that are going to really impact large numbers of people and move away from the traditional project-oriented um, initiatives that are only serve a handful of our population. So this health and all policies approach allows us to collaborate with a large number of people in our community. I've put a bunch of logos at the bottom and I'm sure I've forgotten many people but we have received so much assistance whether it's consultation or technical assistance or just shared resources and tools but again there's a wealth of information out there and very good tools to use to move this type of collaborative work forward. Quite often we're starting projects and then trying to um, do assessments at the same time simultaneously 
and this allows for um, as much flexibility as possible. We have two healthy living collaboratives. One is wellness, which focuses on built environment, and one is on food, which is our local food policy council. We've developed mission and vision and uh, reviewed plans and best practices in the wellness collaborative. We've also developed a strategic plan, shared those with the community, and then uh, have work groups that are working on action steps to address those strategies. Our food collaborative is in a slightly different place. It is um, only in the process of the food assessment. We've had a retreat. We've developed a mission and vision. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we're in the process of conducting our food assessment and developing a strategic plan. And we will follow the same framework that the Wellness Collaborative has followed so far. So just to give you some context for what the Wellness Collaborative achieved, uh, it took a year for us to develop a mission and vision and to review those comprehensive plans, to hear a little bit more about best practices and begin to understand how we were going to create environments where current and future residents would have access to healthy opportunities. So we focused on strategies that would increase access to healthy food and physical activity opportunities, and we wanted to go far beyond raising awareness or doing educational campaigns and programs. So we know that we have to take a multidisciplinary approach to um, work across sectors and jurisdictional lines and focus on policy systems and environmental change. And the slide that you see in front of you, Active Living by Design, served as consultants during this process and continues to support our work. And we had five themes emerge. Uh, increase access to active transportation and trails, improve and support healthy school environments, increase community access to healthy food in Alamance County. And then we also identified funding as a need and advocacy. And what we decided to do was take funding and fold that into our two themes, addressing access to active transportation and trails and improve and support healthy school environments, have a separate group to focus on advocacy for all of those initiatives, and then make the recommendations that came out of that increased community access to healthy food to our Food Policy Council. And subsequently, we've crosswalked that with what's coming out of our assessment. So just to stop for a moment and take a moment to reflect on what a vibrant local food system might look like or mean for Alamance County. Like many counties in North Carolina, we have this long history of agriculture and we're trying to redefine what our future might look like based on existing resources. And that, as Emily alluded to, requires really careful examination of what your resources are and coupling that with enough input from the community so that you get really innovative ideas, but ones that are realistic and needed. We are really very much a county that's in transition right now. We're engaging residents through a variety of ways to determine uh, what we should be focusing on in developing our future. And residents repeatedly report back that they're concerned about preserving land and um, maintaining our ties to agriculture providing opportunities for meaningful progress which support the quality of life of our residents. And our collaborative recognizes that we do have a robust food system that really needs that infrastructure in order to complement those um, objectives of our residents. So this gives you an idea of our usual and unusual suspects. We obviously on our wellness collaborative are primarily our health department all of our planning departments, our recreation and park departments, um, and some nonprofits and a few other groups, the university. But our farmers, uh, or excuse me, our food collaborative has an even more diverse um, selection of participants. And they actually change um, quite frequently. I would say we have about 60 people who are really interested in this topic. And some of them are very, um, entrenched in system level thinking and others are very much uh, embedded in a project or program oriented uh, approach. So that's difficult to manage. It's robust and it means that we get lots of information, but it also means that you have to have a pretty systematic way of taking all of that information 
and moving it in a direction where you can filter out what gaps really exist and what strengths and opportunities really exist within a community because as Emily mentioned there there are a lot of motivations and everyone comes at this with different needs so the reason I put the quote up there is it's an example of what happened after two weeks of just having farmers and consumers sitting around the table participating in a photo voice project where they got to discuss issues around food it doesn't take long for people to begin to share experiences and recognize how they can support each other. And this comment was made by um, one of our customers at the market who's a SNAP recipient and really feels empowered that they get to use their SNAP dollars to support the livelihood of someone else. So it's a process we've alluded to and, and I'm really not certain that this really is the order that uh, this actually goes. We, we do want to tie everything back to our community health assessment and you do have to collect baseline data and you really can't move on with action steps until you've identified what your gaps are. But there's a lot in between there. There's a lot of engagement that goes on. There's a lot of consultation and tools available to you. And um, in the end, it's really looking at not only what's feasible but how are you going to communicate it back to the community and get their um, buy-in into being a part and bringing their resources to the table in order to make things happen. So I mentioned mission and vision and I, I emphasize that because I can't um, really emphasize enough how important it is when you get a group like this together that you have a focal point. It's something that you remind yourselves at every meeting why you're there. And this is uh, the mission that was developed by our food collaborative. It took us quite some time to get there. Um, but it was well worth the time because uh, when you start talking about the definitions of the word local or you start talking about um, the definition for what uh, healthy food might look like in your community or what a food system means, everyone has a different definition and you've really got to take the time to get everybody on the same page. We developed a vision as well, and this is our office for Alamance County. Again, it was probably a four to six month process. But we eventually got into our food assessment. And the key pieces I would take away, give as a takeaway, uh, we used an assessment tool that was developed by the Center for Whole Communities that mapped out different themes. And these measures had definitions for them, and I'll show you those in a moment. But I would, again, just reiterate what I've already said about engagement, utilizing what's available to you and what's already been created, making sure that you continuously find a communication loop for sharing those results back to the community and making recommendations, keeping them engaged in what you're doing, and tying it back to whatever health assessment, whatever plans you have, whatever action steps that you are using in other areas to just um, give it some credibility. So some strengths that emerged from our analysis so far of our assessment is that we have seen an increase in SNAP participation. We've seen an increase in number of authorized retailers. Um, there were more several, there were more school gardens than we thought were in operation. We decided to list that 30% of acreage is owned by farms as a strength and um, the new transportation system I alluded to as a strength. We are seeing rates in obesity and diabetes decrease since 2009, but they're still an issue, and we have seen an increase in markets and grocery stores. Our goals um, are sort of summaries of what's been emerging out of our assessment. So the bolds that you see are the themes that the food assessment identified, justice and fairness, vibrant farms, strong communities, healthy people, thriving local economies, and uh, sustainable ecosystems and so our themes that emerged from those are listed underneath. They're things like improving our community access to a just food system, improving healthy school food environments, increasing those opportunities for farms to connect to consumers, increasing vegetable intake in residents two years and older, increasing the number of short food supply exchange retail opportunities, and really beginning to look at conservation policies um, how they get developed um, and how we engage our local government around those. 
So some emerging strategies, and again, this has actually is where we are in the process. I have to go back to our collaborative in two weeks and vet this with them before we begin to develop our strategic plan and um, move forward with action plan development. So we've still got some work to do around looking at the goals and the strategies and making sure that we're using the language that we want to use and that we really have identified the gaps that we want to focus on. But the strategies that emerged, you can see before you things like increasing the number of female farm operators or increasing the number of farms that benefit from farm to school initiatives, increasing uh, markets that actually accept SNAP, um, the efficiency of farmers markets and farm to fork initiatives. So I would say that what I really loved about the assessment tool is it allowed you know, a large group of people with very different um, skills and very different uh, expertise to come together about a, around a very complex system and give input and you could take everything that they gave you and find a systematic way to list it and still keep the group moving forward in a positive direction. So our next steps are to really begin to look at what methods are available to us for creating more infrastructure around our food system. We want to include and continue to include our planning departments and local government in not only those discussions, but in the development and design of that infrastructure. Um, what we've seen around the state in our research is that um, initiatives are most successful when they're not only embraced by local government but by the community that they're in as well. So part of that is sharing those results and having conversations with both parties. We intend to use the community-based participatory research as a way to engage the community and then use that as an opportunity to begin to educate residents on these issues so that they can begin to advocate for what's needed within their neighborhoods. So that's the end of my presentation, and I think we're at a time for Q&A. Great. Thank you both. Okay, so we have some questions coming in. Folks, feel free to um, continue typing questions in and be sure to say whether you want Anne or Emily or it doesn't matter to answer. Um, so let's go ahead and get started and put Emily in the hot seat. Um, from a planning policy standpoint, could you provide examples of how planning and zoning boards, uh, as well as other regional entities, are engaged in food systems planning process? For example, are there food system work groups at the policy level? Um, that's a really good question, actually. Um, we're seeing it develop in a couple of different ways. Um, one community um, in North Carolina, a regional council of government, has decided to set up its own work group um, that pulls um, representatives from every municipality and county within their coverage region who are interested in that work um, together so that they're looking at the entire region as a whole. Um, another way that I've seen it done is without creating another formal group to look at the issue um, to charge your planning board with it and then um, in turn have that planning board meet with your farmland preservation board and your soil and water conservation district board um, on a quarterly or so basis and integrate those um, types of committees that already exist because a lot of times what you'll find as you get into this is that um, as the local government you've got a lot of the people that you already need at the table even if you're not sure where they are yet. Um, so that I've seen um, quite a bit. And then the other um, option for that that we've seen is that particularly in North Carolina, the, uh, the growth of food councils has really been pretty astronomical. We have one in almost every region. Um, and so a lot of times community um, planners that want to become involved in that will actually go through that structure instead, um, join that collaborative like Ann mentioned or that food council and be on that working group there which brings a lot of those people together. Um, as well. Okay, thanks. And um, I guess while we have Jan and Emily or um, Anne, feel free to 
chime in. Um, can we just get a good definition of food waste for those that this might be sort of a new topic for them and sort of a buzzword that they might not be really familiar with? Sure, Anne, do you want to talk about that or? I would defer to you on that. We've talked a little bit about it and we have a burgeoning awareness of it in Alamance County, but it's not something we've yet to focus on at all. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's true actually of a lot of communities across the country. Um, food waste is sort of one of those areas that's really coming into its own right now in terms of, of research and how much um, uh, emphasis is being placed on it. Um, typically when you're talking about food waste, you're talking about the difference between um, what's consumed and what's thrown away, and there are a number of different ways to measure that, um, but it can also uh, really, really, a big issue in North Carolina it is the food waste that occurs when product is not uh, completely harvested and goes bad before it's able to actually reach its target market. So there's a number of different um, data points that you can look at um, and I'll be happy to add a few um, resources or maybe put one in the chat box so that you can go and explore that a little bit further. Okay, thanks. Um, in the assessment, was there uh, an analysis or an overlay of communities of color to assist with identifying opportunities for expanded outreach and education awareness and et cetera? So I can say in Alamance County, that's what we're doing now to sort of complement the work that's been done at the county level. We recognize that there's not any current initiatives that are really getting community engagement around what's specifically going on in their neighborhoods. That's what we're just beginning to start that process now and I alluded to that with the community-based participatory research. We'll use that methodology to begin to educate the community on the particular topic and get their input on if they feel like that's um, a need or if they have other um, areas within that topic that they want to focus on. And I think um, I would add that I'm not sure what they did um, at the Cap Cape Fear Council, um, but through CEFs um, and our affiliated um, folks at A&T State University, we actually have um, a racial equity program around food systems, and that's a really wonderful resource. Um, they work already with a lot of underserved communities of color, um, and they also work on the other side to educate the rest of those com the communities involved in the planning process on um, sort of the systemic effects on community of color from um, the existing food system and ways to fix that and keep that at the forefront of your mind and that's something that's that's really important going forward not just for food system planning but I think for planning in general and economic development initiatives as well. That's a great resource. Thanks, okay. Um, I think uh, we, we might have touched a little bit on this in the beginning but um, how many acres of farmland are there per capita currently in North Carolina? And can current farmland be enough to support population growth in North Carolina, say, for another 20 years? Um, I'll qualify this by saying that I haven't um, looked at the North Carolina data in the last week or so, um, but the last time that I um, checked on it, we have a great deal of farmland um, in North Carolina. We have a lot of predominantly rural counties. We have about 85 out of 100 um, that are still classified as rural, but the rate at which they are being lost to development um, is, is pretty staggering. And in addition to acres lost on a daily basis, we're also looking at about a 10% um, group of farms that are at risk for development, which means that their family farm owners are aging um, and retiring and no one knows what's going to happen with that farmland. So I think um, 
North Carolina really kind of mirrors the, the national data um, on that level. Um, we have farmland, um, particularly down east. We have a lot of big farmland. Um, I personally am from the mountains where we have a lot of small farmland. Um, so it, it is there and you feel like you see it all the time, but when you start to look at the, the growth rate in North Carolina and how many people are actually migrating into North Carolina to live in the cities, um, you're starting to see that demand go way, way up and the level of preservation of farmland is really remaining static at this point. Can I add to that? That's a huge issue in Alamance County, as I'm sure it is in most, and we are really trying to look at models that would support that infrastructure development to support commodity farmers um, offering some sort of agreement or leasing agreement or mentorship program with mm -hmm. youth that are interested in small-scale farming. And I think, uh, Emily, there's a couple of examples of that or pilots going on in North Carolina? Yes, there are. Um, several of them are available through Seth's website um, and through the Local Foods Extension Program. Um, there's a beginning farmer and rancher program that educates beginning farmers, but then there's also um, a pilot called FarmLink that um, basically serves as, a, as an inventory in your region of farmland uh, that's available and then uh, matches those parcels of farmland with potential farmers and connects the property owner with the farmer. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good point, Anne. Thank you. Um, and Anne, I'll... Um, well, either one of you. We have another uh, definition type question. If either one of you could give a good uh, definition for a food hub for those that are unaware. Mm. Um, can I say something on that, Anne, and then you jump in if you um, want to? <laughs> <Sure>. um, <laughs> this is a question that I um, everybody wants to talk about a food hub, but very few people actually um, are aware of what a food hub is, and part of that is because uh, most of the food hubs in the country are all very different. They're all doing something different. Um, Typically, the, the most basic function of a food hub is to aggregate product, take a lot of product from a lot of smaller uh, units and put it together into larger volume orders that can be sold into wholesale. Um, typically, that's going to require at a very, very minimum um, loading docks, cross stocking so that you can keep things at the temperature that they're supposed to be at, and, and packing services so that you can actually um, take the product that's coming in and get it into uh, what's set by the wholesale buyer for a case or a pallet. Um, a lot of food hubs tackle a, associated functions mostly because they kind of have to. Um, so some of them get into trucking and distribution. Some of them contract with trucking and distribution. A lot of them do collective marketing. Um, a lot of them also use uh, the fact that they have a whole bunch of farmers in one place to do things like buy shared equipment, um, buy shared packing supplies, those kinds of things. Um, but I would say at a, at a very minimum, a food hub is an aggregation center, um, but then you also see a lot of other things being added to that, and typically, because they are at this point mostly grant funded, um, you're going to see them also serving some social or community needs as well, uh, having a farmer's market on site, um, doing cooking classes, those kinds of things. Yeah, it's, it's, it is one of those things that comes up a great deal and people see it as a means to fill a gap. It's, that, it's another example of how everyone's got a different definition of what it means and, mm -hmm. and trying to create a model that's sustainable with grant funding is challenging um, mm -hmm. unless the entire community decides to invest in it up front. Yeah, and that, that I think is a, an important thing to remember when you're looking at food hubs is that there are very few models in the country that are economically and fiscally successful. Um, and those that we do have, um, almost all of the, the successful ones have been in business for 10 or 20 years. Um, it takes a long time to reach profitability. Um, with a food hub and so it's really important that's where that assessment component comes in is you know do you really need a food hub or do you just need cold storage on a farm where other farmers can drop it off until the truck can get there to pick it up um, those kinds of solutions so um, regarding the food hub 
Are there any discussions with them and their locations in terms of um, how far away food is from the consumer, how many miles it travels, how much gas it, it, you know, it eats up just to get from the farm to the table, you know, the entire process of it going to this manufacturer and then that manufacturer and then gets distributed over here and um, just how many miles that the food travels before it hits its end destination. Yeah, that is um, actually probably one of the most effective pieces of data that I've ever seen um, is when it sort of entered the mainstream consciousness that the typical apple that you pick up in your local grocery store traveled 1,500 miles to get to your plate, which is the distance from uh, where I am in Raleigh to Maine and back. It's a long way. Um, so we do have some numbers that way on a national average. Um, typically a food hub is... Um, any, really any uh, regional entity that's going to get that product from the farm to a, a retail or institutional outlet. That's kind of why our wholesale buyer partners are looking at this because their consumers in the grocery store expect to see a little piece of paper next to uh, that beautiful display of produce that says, you know, this is from uh, such and such farms and it's 300 miles away from the store or it's 100 miles away from the store. Um, those are those are becoming um, increasingly in demand uh, products at the grocery store level in particular, um, but also uh, I think institutionally we're seeing it definitely at hospitals which are often leading these wellness initiatives and, and when you go into a hospital cafeteria and you don't see that kind of information it kind of creates this this gap. Um, so most food hubs that are operating, at least in North Carolina, are pulling product from within a very small radius of their food hub, um, typically between 50 and 100 miles, um, and then they are able to aggregate it. And typically the food hubs being located uh, more centrally are closer to the cities where those wholesale distribution houses are. Um, so you're really eliminating the product on two levels, from the farm to the food hub and from the food hub to the wholesale distributor. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is um, kind of the different nuance between a, a farmer's market um, and a local food stand. stand. Um, the question is, uh, the, the asker said that they have found that in their a rural county in Wisconsin in Wisconsin where they're from, they found that establishing a farmer's markets would be utilized less by farmers and residents than individual farm produce stands just scattered around the county. Mm -hmm. So if you could mm -hmm. comment on that, if you found um, any strategies or assessments um, to allow or encourage individual farm produce stands versus, you know, kind of bulk farmers markets? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's actually true. I, I can see that in Wisconsin um, being a much more effective strategy. It's the same way um, in eastern North Carolina, basically anywhere between Raleigh and the coast. Um, you know, you have a lot of big farms and you have these long flat roads and, and individual farm stands are actually much more successful than a centralized um, market would be. Um, a couple of things that we've seen that are successful to encourage that kind of development, um, particularly in rural counties where there's not a lot of other economic driver other than those large farms. Um, it's really successful when multiple farms get together um, and share one larger farm stand that's in a really good geographic location to pick up a lot of traffic. Um, so your host farmer would um, extend the invitation to, you know, if he's per if he's selling his vegetables, then he's going to invite the guy down the road who does pasture-raised pork and the lady who does eggs um, and bring all of that together in one location where there's plenty of parking and lots of signage and um, they can really hit a lot of people in one place. Um, and another thing that I think is, um, is really has helped uh, roadside stands in particular is for planners to pay attention to the way that they regulate and zone um, that kind of 
uh, mobile or roadside market. A lot of times we have these ordinances and they haven't been updated comprehensively, so you have pieces in there that actually would prohibit that kind of um, signage or that kind of construction within, you know, so far of a public road um, and taking a look at those and then making sure that farmers are aware that you've made those changes and that these things are now encouraged and permitted um, and that you have resources for them to do that um, really can can change that because it's one of those problems where somebody has heard that before, their dad told them that that was not allowed and they told all their friends and now everybody think it's it's just not allowed and so that can go a long way towards um, you know eliminating that misunderstanding and, and getting people uh, ready to do that again. Yeah, the city of yeah. Yeah, just 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 what you said, the city of Burlington just changed its ordinance so that you didn't have to sell. Um, you could only sell where you had grown the food. So now mm -hmm. um, farmers can set up in residential areas and um, I haven't seen, it just happened, so I haven't seen the impact on our community yet, but it was a simple change. Mm -hmm. That'll go a long way, hopefully. Um, I guess going, going along with that, um, are there any other things that, that planners can do to help support local food initiatives in their communities aside, you know, fr from what, what we just talked about? Um, I'll go first and then I'm sure Anne will have some things to add as well. Um, there are a number of ways to do this um, depending on the kind of community that you live in. Um, ordinances that already exist are a really good place to start, but then there's sort of bigger um, overall programmatic, you know, what's the function of this ordinance questions that can uh, begin to be answered down here. The city of Winston-Salem is a good example that, um, and the town of Matthews actually as well, both really focused on incorporating urban agriculture into their UDOs. Um, and not only, you know, changed that language to reflect that, but did a lot of work in outreach and engagement with the community to let them know that those things were being encouraged. Um, similarly, I think that uh, councils of government have a huge role to play in this, and they are just beginning to realize it. And planners can really get involved um, on a regional level because food is not something that stays within our arbitrarily drawn boundaries, right? Um, your products that are grown in your county or in your town are typically not all being consumed in your county or your town. It's a regional effort um, and it really, you know, requires you to begin to look at things from a regional level, involve your councils of government, talk to your economic developer both in your county and at a regional level and in surrounding counties. And the other um, really big piece that I would encourage is to um, to start to really look at it from an interdisciplinary perspective, start to look at it from a regional perspective, and then really get down to that data and start looking at what's happening on the ground before you decide to build a food hub or spend public dollars on a project and make sure that you're putting it in the places that it's, that it's really, really needed the most. I certainly agree with that. I, I would just add relationship-wise that um, our relationship that we've developed with our collaborative, with our planners has been invaluable for us because this is information that we do not know, that we haven't worked with before. So they've been instrumental in guiding us through this process um, for both of our collaboratives. I think in return by creating a structure where planning departments get to interface with other groups around the table that they normally don't get to meet with, it provides them with a level of support in the work that they do. Once we started sharing what we were doing with the community, um, we heard back really promising things from different municipalities about how they were thinking of looking at built environment in a very different way. So we've seen nothing but um, very positive results from the time and investment in developing these structures that support conducting these types of assessments. and moving um, built environment initiatives forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, let's start with uh, Emily on this one. Have you noticed any resistance or reluctance from financial institutions to provide loans to upstart farming and processing companies, especially where in 
this was brought up earlier, where the, the value for development is greater than the value of the land for farming. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a really good question, actually, and I was hoping that we were going to get to cover it in the Q&A. Um, so traditionally, yes, we see barriers to finance and access to capital all the time, um, at least for the last 10 years, um, as that conflict between you know land value for development and preservation value um, has continued to grow. But what we are actually seeing now, just really beginning in North Carolina and across the country, is that a lot of um, non-traditional lenders, um, so not your typical big banks, but places that are um, state level or regional level CDFIs, community development finance institutions, um, places that are channeling federal funding down to a uh, state or regional level, um, and then a lot of programs also through USDA, through their Rural Development Office. Um, a lot of that money is now being actually specifically targeted to farms and food entrepreneurs um, because they are such a bad bet for big banks, um, but they're such a critical component, um, both of small business development, but also of the larger food system as a whole. And I think you're starting just now really to see uh, financing programs that are being developed specifically with those audiences in mind. And they're actually, you know, at least here in North Carolina, um, the Support Center is one that I know of, um, and the Rural Center as well. Both have done a really good job of reaching out to those existing resources that Anne was talking about earlier and letting, letting those resources help them develop those programs so that they kind of eliminate a lot of the equity questions and a lot of the um, the justice questions and how that financing is distributed right off the bat. Um, and I think that's a trend that I hope that we see uh, nationwide for sure. Very good point though. Great. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, has there been any attention to processing freezing canning facilities for producers or households and neighborhood groups? Um, the asker says helping households was once a staple activity of cooperative extension offices. Mm -hmm. It was. Um, and I'll jump in really quickly, and then um, maybe you have some examples of what's happened in Alamance County. Um, it, it was always a really, a really important function of cooperative extension, and you've actually seen a revival um, in North Carolina of interest in those types of programs. A lot of our extension offices are uh, operating loan programs for things like canning equipment and crock pots. Um, but on a, on a larger level, I think a lot of people did the same thing with community and commercial kitchens uh, that they are now doing with food hubs. And they said, oh, we got to have one. And so they built one. Um, and then nobody comes. <laughs> and that's partly a function of bad marketing. And it's partly, I think, a function of just being a little too early. Um, we are seeing some success with uh, shared kitchen facilities. One that we profile on our website that's a good, a good model um, is Piedmont Food and Agriculture Processing, which is located in Hillsborough in Orange County, North Carolina. Um, when they started, they were a four-county initiative. Um, definitely had some slow growth that they, you know, um, really had to pay attention to uh, making sure that they made it uh, financially successful, but now they're actually functioning almost at capacity, um, and you've got a lot of businesses that are actually starting out of that shared kitchen, which is kind of the function of that incubator, right, is to make sure that they have a launch pad for things like that. So now they have um, Seal the Seasons, which is a frozen uh, berries and foods company that takes local products from North Carolina and flash freezes them for grocery store sales. Um, there's a popsicle company called Luna Pops that started there and operates out of there. And so it really, you know, it kind of depends on where you're located. Um, and also I think uh, it's a timing issue uh, for those types of facilities, but they really can actually have a, a pretty good economic impact if you do it right and you stick with it and you uh, really put a lot of time and effort into getting people in there. And I think the other thing that's helped all of those facilities on a national level is food trucks. Um, food trucks would be another place where planners automatically have some uh, something to offer to the food system. Um, food trucks are really popular, but they all 
also require um, a certified kitchen from which they can operate in order to be uh, compliant with most local health codes. So um, having a shared use kitchen allows food trucks to base their work out of there, prepare their food there um, in order to take it on the truck. And that, um, I think Piedmont Food and Ag has something like 13 or 14 food trucks that all operate out of that same facility. So it's another channel for that development. Yeah, uh, I would, Hel Alamance County was one of the four counties associated with the mm -hmm. Hillsboro Initiative. And what, what we're seeing currently are a growing number of farmers who are really interested in connecting here in Alamance County with a commercial kitchen. And so we're trying to facilitate that process. And the, the biggest, I think, impediment really for utilizing a commercial kitchen on someone else's you know, on a, a large organization's property is really the liability and the coordination of who would who would handle those pieces, who's mm -hmm. going to absorb that overhead. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to work through that um, and think that that's a conversation that I would say maybe two years ago was not one that would go anywhere. And I would say now people are becoming more familiar and more comfortable with the concept and, and are willing to come to the table and talk about how that might look. And I know we're close to time, but I would just also add that Greensboro um, and Hannah Cockburn, who has um, mm -hmm. helped put this session together, um, they actually did um, an examination of their community um, food access uh, last year. And, and the way that they're looking at solving that is actually by putting commercial kitchens and farmers markets into recreation areas um, at recreation centers throughout the city in food deserts, um, utilizing existing infrastructure and really trying to go at it from a really innovative way. So if you're interested in that, I would definitely talk to Hannah um, about her work on that. Okay, thank you. Um, Emily did send me a link uh, to the EPA Food Recovery Highlights webpage, and I reposted it in the chat box function um, on, the, on your GoToWebinar toolbar, so everyone can go ahead and see that if they're interested in that uh, website. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close up. So uh, thanks to the North Carolina chapter for sponsoring today and for Emily and Anne for joining us and, and talking all about this topic. It was great. And uh, thanks again. And we will talk next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.